It's that time. Your fix is here. College football is a year-round discussion with these two. Here's J.C. and Morgan. Mike Morgan of ESPN and J.C. Sherbert of 24-7 Sports have you covered. Beginning right now. And we welcome everybody here on another installment of J.C. and Morgan. I am in Studio C in sunny South Florida. J.C. back in Chi-Town. And once again, we have plenty to discuss here over the next mm, hour, hour and a half. Typically <clears throat> how we run around here. We've got Tim Brando, friend of the show, joining us uh, in about 30, 35 minutes. <clears throat> if you've been following us over the years, this time of year, off season, there, there really is no off season, but we like to get a little guest heavy. In the last few weeks alone, we've had Dan Wetzel, Ross Dellinger, Tom Luganbill. Um, I know I'm forgetting somebody right off the top of my my head, but we've we've had a number of kind of uh, home run guests of, of guys that follow the sport uh, nationally and really do a great job of it. And and Timmy B is one of those guys. And what I like about having Timmy B on, he loves being on. Like he, he's <laughs> always got strong opinions and thoughts on the sport. And I think when the last time we had him on, JC, is when he was uh, waxing poetic about the fact that <clears throat> when this playoff is implemented, he said, don't, don't be fooled. Now it's only going to be a two-year deal, and don't be surprised if they go to 16 right after that. <clears throat> well, he was, he was on to something. The number's 14, uh, and who knows? By the time two years comes around, there might be another addendum that makes it 16. Once you start, once you start cracking into that cash coffer that is playoff expansion, it's real hard to have discipline to say no. I mean, we're seeing this in basketball right now. The expan- expansionists are alive and well saying, why not 72? How about 76? How about 80? How about 96? It just never ends. Um, in football, I... I could justify it to 12. Don't know exactly how I feel about 14. I know I don't want to go much more than that. Basketball is the perfect number at 68. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Uh, Anyway, we'll talk about all those things and many other discussion points here on the program. It's JC and Morgan, uh, part of the Chief Sports app and presented proudly by Site Pro Rentals and Nest and Wild Mattress Company. JC, good morning. As you click away on that mouse as only you can, how are you, sir? Oh, yeah, I didn't know I was picking that up, my bad. I meant to always meant to mute. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're, you're good. Retweeting our show from our tweet deck. I now like that. X Pro, but uh, yeah, but we're, we're, we're here trying to drum up an audience today. Really good. We'll, we'll be great to catch up with Timmy B with all that's been going on. Why not? I still, I'm, I'm beside myself. Why not 16? And I, I still think people are. Like a lot of decisions that have been made, this this notion that these on-campus home games in the first round aren't going to meet anything, and that fans and, and and nobody's cared about the fans the whole time they've done all of this stuff. Um, that fans don't want. I mean, they're, they're going to be oh, okay, well that's cool. We just beat this team in the championship game, and so we get to book a flight to Phoenix or or wherever Miami uh, and wait, and they get a home game. I mean, I, you know, to me, I, I think those home games are going to start to mean a lot more and we'll probably quickly uh, go to 16 because you're really talking about just one more game. It's more money for everybody. I mean, I, I don't I, – I would imagine, I guess, the one versus 16 would be kind of like the tournament in basketball where you would never have a pick upset barring some kind of crazy injury or something. But I, uh, I don't understand 14. Uh, you know, I liked – you know, 12 was kind of a cattywampus setup with, with the buys and things like that. But it made a lot of sense to me. Oh, top four, okay, you know, you get, you get a pass on to the next round. Then there's four fan bases without a home game. But but now it's just like just the top two. I mean, to me, it seems a bit punitive to the fan bases. But, uh, you know, the players and coaches, they'll probably like the day all week off. I, I don't know. I, I just uh, 14 seems weird to me. Um, but we'll see how it shakes out. I mean, I, I, the it, only thing I can think of, JC, and, uh, pardon me if you're interrupting, I just, I, I, I think it's they still want to give motivation to the top teams 
and the conference championship games, which stand to be less relevant in this current format. So by giving you that odd number, giving two teams a buy, you can at least on the surface convince everybody that there's still a lot riding on, say, the SEC and the Big Ten championship game, which is really what they're anticipating. They're not worried about the ACC champion getting – in fact, they tried to, to make it mandatory. The top two teams that get the bye are the SEC and the Big Ten, which I thought was a pretty brash and bold – I mean, that's the ultimate power play. That didn't yeah. go through, but I, that's the only thing I can think of uh, is, is that they're trying to keep some relevance to that. I mean, to me, if do it now would be like the net rankings in basketball. It's, it's not real. It's fake. <laughs> you know, because it's not every year the top two teams are from those two leagues. I'm sorry. Sure. They historically are the two best, but, I mean, especially the SEC. But, man, there's some years the Big Ten champion is not, you know, not in the in the hunt. You know, I mean, it's uh, – I, and I don't, as, as that league grows to the, the monstrosity that it is, I think you're going to see all kinds of upsets and things like that that are unexpected. And But I get it. They're trying to protect the brand and uh, the money, certainly with $21 million per school going out for Big Ten and SEC. ACC gets 13 Big 12 gets 12 I'm not so sure the Big 12 top to bottom isn't a better football conference, but historically, you know, you got Cincinnati, Oklahoma, TCU, TCU is the only one to ever make the, the championship game uh, out of that. I guess Texas technically was Big 12 last year, too. But, um, you know, the ACC has normally had, you know, at least they've had Clemson and Florida State right there uh, through the history of the playoffs. I, I get it. But, I mean, I don't know, man. It's just uh, the more we go down this path, Mike, the more I'm kind of turning into – an old man yelling You're sounding at the cynical. You're sounding I'm, old get, I, I, I'm starting to get a little more cynical <laughs> about it because I feel like, you know, the TV folks and, and God bless TV, they're the straw that stirs the drink. They're the ones with the money and all that. I almost feel like there are people making decisions TV wise that, that it's just it's not good for the game and, and college athletics and uh, period. I mean, I think, I think there's people making decisions that maybe don't understand college sports. Uh, when there's talk of retraction out there and you're talking about cutting programs that have 70,000 season ticket holders because they don't play well on TV, that's when the sport loses its magic. I mean, people talk about paying players in the portal and all that. Oh, it's pro sports now. It'll be pro sports when you see some really, really good programs with proud history and tradition that maybe don't play on TV as well uh, go to a lower level because the same people that – created the world housewives of new jersey you know want to create this new <laughs> reality show uh and and, and and what got me was i, I was okay with southern cal and, and ucla went to the big 10 i was like that's weird but and i was okay with it happened but the more i think about it the more i'm like dude that's you know that's the, that's a completely different part of the other reason is that, you know you're going to lose your style of play I mean, it's a completely different style of play in that league. Completely different. I mean, th those teams aren't equipped to go up with it. I mean, I, I just – I get it. You played the Rose Bowl every year. Great. That doesn't mean much, you know, when it comes to week in and week out competing. Um, so, I, I don't know what to think. I, I'm just uh, – as we get further and further, I'm, I'm kind of turning a little more cynical well, uh, toward it. And, and when you hear these things about retraction to – and and and, and – you know, like we asked Wetzel the last time we were on, you know, he's hearing the same kind of things. You know, you have to really question, do, do they know what the hell they're doing? Because, honestly, the magic of college football is it can take place in downtown Los Angeles and be special, and it can take place in Starkville, Mississippi, and be special at all points in between. You know, other than that, it's just NFL light, which great. You wanted to you, you, uh, go start a semi-pro league. I mean, and fail like the rest of them. Don't don't take away what's made us, uh, you know, love the sport for 150 years. For, for those that don't know what, what JC is alluding to with contraction, uh, Jerry Wetzel of uh, Yahoo Sports uh, always has a, a good take on things when it comes to college sports. Was talking about the the possibility of down the road of as conferences like the SEC and the Big Ten expand and try to get more big brand names in there, you could also contract at the same time. And I mean, 
I've never been to Pullman. It's one of the few college towns I haven't been to. But it's, it's from what I understand, it's not that different than Starkville, right? Uh, Corvallis is probably not that much different than Starkville either. Or I'm trying to think of, of, of an ACC Pullman, hop on Tobacco Road, maybe. Winston Pullman is probably Island. more like Clemson, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pullman's yeah. a lot like Clemson. Right. But Clemson's stadium's, half stadium's half the size. Stadium's half the size. And then Corvallis would be more like Athens. Uh, yeah. Or Oxford, uh, somewhere between maybe not quite as large as Athens, but not not quite as small as Oxford. Like they have a town square and things like that, and it's twenty miles from the Pacific Ocean. So yeah, yeah. You've been both. Yeah, they're and, solid and, and, little towns. Yeah, yeah, no question. Uh, the, and the thing is, and I and I, I I bring up like I'm not trying to contradict some of our um, uh, media brethren. But I hear people still they, they have hot takes that would have been applicable 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago when they talk about, yeah, but such and such wants this market size. Um, you know, I, I was working with a guy in Atlanta and he was, you know, he's a big Georgia Tech guy. And he's like, I mean, how could how could the Big Ten not want the market of Atlanta? Folks, that is. That is how it used to be looked at when they were launching things like the SEC network and worried about markets, this market, that, uh, you know, having Rutgers in New Piscataway, it's not exactly turning on a bunch of TV sets to uh, to Rutgers football. Now, granted, it helped the Big Ten expand its footprint, but we're now in a cord cutting era. So it, I, it's not a, you got to get the old mentality out of your head. It's not about market size. If it, if it was, everybody would want Georgia Tech in Atlanta or Tulane in New Orleans or even UCF in Orlando. I mean, UCF being in Orlando didn't hurt, but UCF became a, a, a big deal because they were winning because they put together some magical seasons. Tampa is every bit the market Orlando is, but USF decided to all of a sudden just go in the doldrums they, they they started they landed in the abyss with their football program and so they didn't get called up to the big league so to speak so it's not about market size uh Clemson is in a small very rural market it's not a great TV market now if you combine it with Greenville Spartanburg you know, I realize that changes matters but Clemson is going to be okay just like Alabama is going to be okay because they are brands and that's what these conferences now want they want the brand it's more than the geography people tune into a notre dame game not because they love south bend or it's this huge market even though it is close to a big market they tune in because it's notre dame people tune in alabama who have never been to tuscaloosa because it's alabama so the the whole market size uh, model, so to speak, again, that's that's living in, in a five year, 10 year ago mindset. And what what Wetzel's point was, is that a program like Mississippi State, for, not because it's Starkville, but because they don't they're not the brand that LSU, Alabama, Auburn, another small rural area, but they're a brand. Uh, Florida, Tennessee, like the, these are bigger brands. And his point was that the smaller brands that have long story traditions in leagues like the Big Ten and the SEC, they could be left in the cold. I don't personally believe that. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I, I don't think anybody's going to be siphoned off. First off, that would be really hard to do legally, <laughs> um, as we see so many other things going to the courts. But I just don't think I don't think you're going to create a whole lot of um, goodwill with your fan bases if you're a conference commissioner and you go, you know what? Yeah, thanks for the 70 years of tradition, but we found a bigger brand that's going to get more eyeballs when they're on the game of the week on ABC or Fox. I, I don't really anticipate that. I do think we have another. We have at least one more rather large size domino to drop and it resides in the ACC as it presently is constructed. And I don't think it's going to be constructed that way a whole lot longer. And, and I realize that might be contradicting some of the things that I've said in the past, because I've pointed out for years now with all the Tom, Dick and Harry's that want to say, I've got a source and I just heard Clemson's leaving. I've got a source and I just heard Florida state found their sugar daddy and they're leaving tomorrow. 
Well, none of those things have been right. And I've pointed out from what I understand, uh, there was no reason to believe there was a loophole in this contract, this grant and rights TV deal through 2036. And I think what I said on that has stood to be true at the same, by the same token, I also recognize this is a moving target and there's a good possibility that these two programs are so utterly determined to get the hell out of there that where there's a will, there might be a way. In other words, they could, it, it seems to me what they're shooting for. And by the way, the ACC's filed a countersuit against Florida state. Um, they are, are basically saying, look, you got us by the short hairs, ACC, but let's make a deal. You want you want money? Is that what this is all about? You want money? We'll get you some stinking money, all right? But then let us out. We don't want to be here. You know we don't want to be here. It's kind of counterproductive to promote us as part of your brand when everybody in, in the free world now knows you don't want to be here. Why don't you just go ahead and let us out? And here's a couple hundred million dollars for the effort. I, I think that's what they're trying to do. And I it's it's like a old fashioned standoff, you know, who's going to blink here? Who is going to blink? And if it does happen, and if FSU and Clemson is true to their word and they're clearly telling people uh in their camps, you know, big time boosters and whatnot, hey, don't worry, we're we're gonna get out of this deal one way or another. If that is true, then I don't know where the ACC stands, honestly, because at that point, I think it becomes another wild, wild west scenario. It's basically the Big East light at that point with some West Coast schools. I don't know. Definitely goes below the Big 12 in the pecking order. Um, yeah, I don't know. Because, you know, Clemson and Florida State get out. North Carolina's right behind them. Virginia's right behind them. You know, Virginia Tech and NC State are going to want out. Miami is saying the right things. Dan Radakovich said he was committed to the ACC the other day. You know, that's yeah. a steaming pile of horse poo uh, when all is said and done. Uh, if everybody else leaves, you know, so it, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, I, I feel bad and Red doesn't like the ACC. I Morning, apologize Red. for the dog. Um, <laughs> he, sees a, he sees a bunny. But it, it's, it's hard for me to feel sorry for the conference because they've acted in such a, such a, going back to the 70s, man. And I'm an old South Carolina guy and there's a lot of bad blood there. Just kind of how they've run their show over the years, I think sucks. I think they've been very arrogant in their approach uh, to expansion. Uh, if you remember, this is the same league that did not want to take Virginia Tech because they thought that basically the State University of Virginia, which is what Virginia Tech is, uh, UVA is a public Ivy. It's a different category of school. Most everybody, all the kids, Virginia Tech's like Virginia State, like a, like a state university. They didn't want that because academics, uh, and they had to be forced to do it by the government in Virginia because they wanted almighty Syracuse in the league. They finally got Syracuse and Pitt. Oh, look at us, these AAU schools or whatever. Well, then Maryland walks out the door, and who they go get? Louisville. Right. Uh, ask your wife about Louisville's academic reputation sometimes, which I don't <laughs> care about academics. And and so, so they're the reason West Virginia is in the Big 12, because West Virginia should have been the first one. West Virginia is a top 25 winning program of all time. And, and they, they turned their nose up to them. Uh, I think they're arrogant. I think they're arrogant in signing the stupid deal and, and launching the stupid network, which they had to do, I understand, uh, has hurt them. And I think they've been le not proactive at all in trying to, to help out their schools because I don't think in the DNA of that conference that that's what they've been focused on. I think it's football's nice. But it's been misstep after misstep. I honestly still think it's a tobacco road basketball conference, just like it's always been, that fancies themselves as some sort of Southern Ivy League or East Coast Ivy League, if you will. So I, I, I don't I don't feel sorry for the league um, at all in all of this. No, I yeah, it's not about feeling sorry for um, as much as it is, man. I, I can't even imagine like you're Jim Phillips, and I know he's he's taking all the bullets right now, and that's fine. But Jim Phillips didn't create this mess. This this mess was years in the making. And he took over a couple of years ago. And then it's like, what do you expect him to do? Like, like what, what would a good conference commissioner do if, if Jim Phillips is not a good, I'm not here, sitting here telling you Jim is great or bad or good or anything. I've met the man a couple of times. Nice enough guy. 
but he is he is trying uh I'm not going to use the Titanic reference again. I use that enough with the the pack uh and Kleofkov, you know, telling the band to, you know, change taking requests for the band as the ship is sinking and ordering another gin and tonic, but it's not quite Titanic, but it's certainly it, it it's a plane with heavy turbulence. Okay. And it's a plane that might be running on one engine instead of two. And I don't know what his move is. How do you convince, you know, it's the guy, it's like the guy who's madly in love with a woman who clearly doesn't feel that way. And he just like is buying more and more roses and chocolates. And he's inviting her to like exotic Caribbean uh, trips together. And she's like, yeah, I'll, I'll take the plane ticket, uh, but we're sleeping in separate beds, and uh, you go on this side of the resort, and I'll go on that side of the resort. But yeah, no, 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 I, I, I like you. I, can can like you a, get a pool boy to come rub this oil on my back, exactly. sweetie? Excuse me, that one right over there, the tan one, the brown one. Yes, that's him, Pedro, the one with the the mankini on. Yes, yeah, yeah, the uh, banana yeah, hammock guy. That, that banana hammock, Pedro. Guy. There's, yeah, there's there's a visual. Uh, you know that, that that's at, at some point, like you just. You can't make somebody love you. You can't make a Florida State and Clemson want to be there. And I don't even know if there's a sweetener to be done. We're like, okay, we'll give you – I think they've tried this, and I don't know the exact calculus that they offered. But, okay, we'll give you a greater percentage of the revenue because you're going to the playoff more. So whoever goes to the playoff more gets a higher – you know, more units, if you will. I, I don't know if – uh if any of that uh, really works, but uh, they're trying by golly. They're, uh, they're, <laughs> they're really, uh, they're trying to do their best. Uh, okay. Do we have time for a, should we, you tell me, because once again, I've, I've veered us into choppy waters. You want to do JC five here or do you want to do? Let's roll a quick JC five. All right. I, tempo, Timmy, tempo. Timmy, Timmy B. Yeah. Let, let's roll that real quick. Red Phil. dog, red yeah. dog, red dog. Red no, dog. Home, red dog. It's time. Black 59 the Razor. Topics in the sport. We bring the JC5. Number one. All right. Greg Sankey, right, you know, who I think has a level head in all this, Phil and Mike, or Mike. Um, one thing I'm disagreeing him on, and it, it kind of chaps my butt a little bit, uh, and he, he got, got called out on it, probably wrongfully so. I don't think the NCAA basketball tournament needs to be touched. I, I don't think it needs to expand. I don't think we need 500 power five teams in it. Uh, you know, if anybody had a case this year as the Big East, I just I, – I don't think that's what the country wants to see. So I don't know who's, like, pushing this and talking about it, but it needs to stop because you don't sacrifice March Madness at the altar of football. Even helmet heads like me love March Madness. Your thoughts? Uh, in the spirit of time, I'm going to keep this real quick. Agreed. And uh, it, this is not even though Sankey took all the bullets because uh, quotes were used and the SEC had a rough uh, opening two days in March Madness. So it was kind of time for a lot of people that despise the dominance of the SEC as a league to just kind of say, OK, here's your comeuppance. The fact of the matter is all these power four commissioners want this. They want more of them and less of Cinderella. They want more of them and less group five mid-major type bids, period. That they're all looking out for themselves. Nobody, nobody who's in that position truly cares about the overall good for the sport or of the tournament. So th we shouldn't be surprised by this. Everybody is looking out for their own. That's what people in this business do, and it is a business as we know. Uh, but uh, long story short, I, I agree. I hope it stays at 68. I don't, don't take away Oakland. Don't take away the great mid-major stories. I mean, look, the SEC just had eight bids. When the Big Ten and the ACC are really, really good, they're around that number. That's over half the league. That, that's enough. I mean, that's that's great. Yeah, I, I don't think you need to sacrifice. Now, there is a, uh, like the Fran plan, Fran for Schilla, where you expand it, but you don't do so at the expense of the automatic bids. So those would still be in play but you'd have a, an extra couple of play-in rounds uh, that would allow more bubble teams from the power conferences to go. I don't even know how I feel about that, but uh, I'm with you. Uh, this tournament is one of the few things on the sports calendar that never, ever, ever disappoints, and I'm okay with it where it is. 
number two. All right, unfortunate news out of Ann Arbor. Rod Moore gets hurt in spring practice, throat tears in ACL. Mike, uh, this is not an epidemic, but people are going to start talking about how there needs to be less contact in spring practice. Uh, something that needs to be addressed or just part of the game, your take on spring injuries. In my experience in covering spring ball and, for that matter, preseason NFL football during my time with the Panthers, most of the injuries like this are non-contact. I don't think you could take much more contact out than they already have. If you watch a spring football game, uh, for that matter, if you cover spring practice, like they have scaled back immensely. There's just not much more they can do to uh, make this any <laughs> softer, for lack of a better word. So uh, injuries are part of the game. Like it's it's going to happen, and so many of them are non-contact injuries anyway. You're just going to have them like sit on a sofa and order pizza for eight months out of the year, and then for four months suit it up and you know get the be a weekend warrior. You can't do that. You can't do that. So I I, I see this argument happen every time a, a big time injury happens in either the spring or the fall. There's too much contact. There's too much. We already got rid of two a days, right? I mean we we've already eliminated so much of the contact that no, I don't think you can, you ask any football coach, they'll tell you, we can't possibly teach football and teach things like blocking and tackling. If we do any less of blocking and tackling in practice. Number three. Okay. Two places. You've been a whole lot. I want to get your take on it. It's an either or tiger stadium at night. Or the swamp when the Gators were rolling under Urban and Spurrier. Tougher place to play. Oh, wow. Uh, well, this this is like a primacy recency bias, right? <laughs> the swamp hasn't been kicking for a while. So you have to like you have to reach back a little bit into the memory bank and remember what that was like as opposed to LSU just won a national title a few years ago with Joe Burrow and company. Uh, they're both outstanding. I will tell you this, that it's just like anywhere else. I don't care how good a fan base you are. When you're not winning, you don't have an intimidating venue. There's more and more aluminum, as in no fannies in the seats that are, are uh, is displayed. The fans are – sometimes they can work against you. Sometimes a home crowd that's disgruntled with their coach or with the team and where they're playing – you can feel the angst in the air. There's some boo birds. There's some gasping. There's awkward silence. I, I've run into teams that are almost glad they're away from home when they're not playing well. Uh, but I think those two, when everything, when all conditions are right, are two of the most intimidating, not just in the SEC in the country. LSU, I'll say, is the nastiest. So let's go with LSU. Um, there's legendary stories about buses, what's been thrown at them. Uh, LSU has developed – Tennessee is trying to get that way with, with some of their wow. antics. Yeah. But but I think LSU at, at night, that it's, it really is a different venue at night. I'll go LSU. My buddy, Georgia fan, got hit in the head with a ham sandwich there in 2003. Did he eat it? Ge Georgia won the game. I don't know. had mustard fully loaded too. Oh, wow. That's not a bad number thing if it's, you know, it's a good, healthy sandwich. All right, number four, Alabama. I so I keep, I keep reading around the country in recruiting that Alabama has all these spots left, and they're going to raid all these rosters in the portal in spring. So my question to you, Mike, is will we step back and go, wow, because they've already gotten Caden Proctor back from Iowa, allegedly, um, or will we sit there and go, ah, that was a lot of hype, and, and they're just going to kind of carry on. Maybe they'll add a few here and there. Will it be a normal or abnormal second portal window for the Crimson Tide? Wow, this is really more your ballpark than mine. You keep up with the – I mean, I still can't believe we haven't adjusted the portal dates uh, better. You know right now the portal is open in college basketball. As we get ready for the Sweet 16, there are players on teams – that are being courted by other teams as they get ready for their Sweet 16 games. It's not healthy. That, not healthy, right? Now, in football, we just made an adjustment, right, to the, to, the, to the window before championship games, right before conference championship games. Is that, am I right on that? Yeah. 
So, they, they, so. Uh, the portal window opens after conference championship games. High okay. school recruiting signing day is going to be before. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of answering a different question, but I don't know what to expect from Alabama, honestly. I, I Look, Alabama is still going to recruit itself. You know, Nick obviously got to a point where you'd set your watch to it. Every year was a top five recruiting class, and very often it was number one. I think the stat was something like nearly half of the years he was coached Alabama, they had the number one recruiting class in the country. And then Georgia started saying, wait a minute, uh, we know how to do this too. But I, I think Alabama is still going to recruit at a high level. I don't think that's going to be the issue for Kalen DeBoer. The issue is going to be chasing near perfection, which is what Nick Saban did. No one in the sport has ever come as close to it as Nick Saban, ever, in over 100 years. Can Kalen DeBoer come close to that? I, I just don't know. But I do think when it comes to the portal and the money that it, it, it requires to get the best of the best in, in, uh, in the portal and transfers, I, I still think they'll be right up there. Number five. All right, we're getting a fearsome foursome for five, Mike. And uh, highest upside in your eyes in 2024. There's four teams. You can only okay. pick one. All right. The Oregon Ducks. The LSU Fighting Tigers. Go Tigers. The Michigan Wolverines, the defending national champs. Or the Texas Longhorns. Okay, so here's the way my brain works. And I don't think I'm alone on this. The first thing I did was think of quarterbacks. So Oregon, Oregon's losing a first-round quarterback in Bo Nix. LSU's lo- losing a first-round quarterback in Jaden Daniels. Michigan's losing a first-round quarterback in J.J. McCarthy. So who am I left with? Texas. The, uh, the Longhorns, of course. And they have their quarterback coming back. And Clint. they've also got some pretty good talent around him. And Arch Manning waiting in the wings. And, uh, uh, and he may never even see the field and is probably <laughs> making like seven figures in NIO money just sitting on the bench and holding a clipboard. Life is good if you're an Arch – if you're a Manning, period. But if you're Arch Manning, oh, yeah. it's not that bad. <laughs> if he really wanted to play right away, he could have transferred. He decided not to do it. I, I, I got to go Texas. I know it'll be their first year in the SEC, and so they might have a slice of humble pie. But in my eyes, um, they are the most equipped – you don't just replace – first of all, Michigan's also got to replace a coach in addition to J.J. McCarthy and Blake Corum. I mean, they're, 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 they're going to lose eight. Two. When you watch the draft, as many of us will, and you know me, I'm kind of a draft nerd, there are going to be a lot of Michigan players announced at that podium on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. A lot of them. A lot of them. So even though they recruit well, I don't think you just replace that. And I don't think you just replace Harbaugh. Uh, so I, I got to go Texas. I don't know if the number will represent it, but I think they've got a chance to be a better team. When I say the number, the record, they might take a couple of losses in the regular season, but they're still going to go to the playoff, right? I mean, it's going to be like four yeah. teams on the SEC that probably go. I, I I like the way their schedule says up too, Mike. They they Oklahoma of the two newcomers, Oklahoma has the toughest uh, schedule. With the, neither one's really overloaded. But outside of playing Georgia, I think Texas has a pretty good. You know, they got A and M, of course. They got Oklahoma, of course. The Arkansas, but they don't. Um, they avoid, uh, you know, some of your your, your bigger landmines. I, I think so. I, I like. I like. I mean, they got Vandy on the schedule, so I, you know, I, I like it. I like their schedule. How their schedule sets up and their personnel. I'd, if I had to pick right now. Uh, he put a gun to my head, and I may change my mind. I would say Georgia, Texas, probably top two in the league. Um, just and you know, yeah, not trying to spoil it and say the Longhorns are going to come in here and win it the first year. But man, you know, we've doubted these Big Twelve teams coming over before, and all A and M did was go eleven and two and have the Heisman winner their first year. Yeah, and then Missouri wins the East in year two and three. So. You know, uh, maybe I'm a little gun shy uh, by, by just declaring that they'll struggle in the mighty SEC. But I, I do like Texas's personnel and their schedule and how it sets up for next season. So I'd have to agree with you. And I would. I, well, Oregon's got enough coming back if they do replace their quarterback at a high level that they can make some noise. LSU. I'm going to have to see what Garrett Nussmeyer does. Uh, they're I high like on him. him. Yeah, like they're high him. on him. Yeah. 
uh, the the problem with LSU last year obviously wasn't quarterback, and, and no, he's not going to be Jaden Daniels in year one as a starter. Yeah. But they didn't defend a lick. Yeah, I want to see what Blake Baker, their new defensive coordinator, there does. I mean, they replaced. I mean, he was at Missouri last year, and obviously crafted that bad boy. I mean, Missouri went from one of the worst defenses in the country under Steve Wilkes, of all people, two years prior in 2021. And then Baker takes over. He was on staff, just got promoted by Eli Drinkwitz to one of the best in the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, they held Ohio State to a field goal. I know Ohio State had some opt-outs and things like that, but there's enough firepower from the Buckeyes to where they could have at least put up 14 on somebody. They did not. They did. They had trouble moving the ball against his defense. And he's a Louisiana guy, LSU guy, so he's back home just like Coach O was. And so I, I think that's the magic – that's the magic spice in the gumbo, so to speak, uh, when you're talking to LSU. But I need to see it. I need to see it before it happens. And uh, LSU's got a pretty tough schedule. I mean, their schedule, their league draw is much tougher than Texas's. So we'll see. And then I think Michigan could, I hate to say it, take a step back um, just because they lost too much. You know, sometimes yeah. you lose too much. So. And, and Ohio State is printing money and bought everything in sight in the offseason. You want to talk about, we talk about caged animal syndrome. That's oh as close goodness. as you can get without firing the head coach. That you know, that's the closest you can get. They bought everybody's players, and they took UCLA's head coach, made him their OC. It, what, what Ohio State did this offseason with, with what they poached and what they bought, it, it even made Gordon Gecko feel a little bit uneasy. Like even Gordon Gecko, as he was sitting in his chair with the, the greed is good poster behind him said, wow, that's aggressive. Like he, even, even the Gordon Geckos of the world are like, man, oh man, what is going on? It was, it was just like Thank they, on the monopoly board. They just put, they just put hotels down on, uh, what, what is it? Uh, uh, park place and uh, no, Boardwalk. Yeah. Boardwalk and Park 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 Avenue, yeah. Park the one, Park one, Avenue. The one thing to watch is Mike. We don't know who their quarterback is going to be yet. Uh, it'll correct. be somebody good. I mean, it'll be somebody capable, obviously, but we don't know yet. So we'll see. We'll see what happens yeah. there because that can that can be that can take a, a, a fifteen and zero type team to thirteen and two if you don't, as you know, if you don't have good, if something goes askew. But they're certainly talented there, and they have enough options. Right. So. I know one thing, you you do all that, you spend that much, and you're Ryan Day who's already been uh, – the, the seat's already been warm. You better come up with serious results this year <laughs> in 2024. All right, serious results is what Tim Brando specializes in uh, when it comes to his thoughts on the college football, college basketball landscape. We'll get to him on the other side. It's JC and Morgan. Down here in the south, we don't always see eye to eye. While our taste in college football teams, or what sauce, if any, goes best on a rack of ribs, or what to mix with our Dixie vodka might be up for debate, we can all agree there's nothing better than a southern tailgate. And like our favorite college teams, our ingredients come from small towns and big cities. They're grown in southern soil, are crafted by southern hands, and proudly represent the south in our backyard and beyond. So raise a glass of Dixie Southern Vodka to celebrate being made in America and raised in the south. Hey, folks, want to tell you about our friends at Titan Construction Group really quick. They're a mid-Atlantic-based general contractor, specializes in retail, restaurant, and office construction. TCG strives to separate itself from other general contractors by adding value every step of the process. From project budgeting to estimation, value engineering to construction, they focus on those relationships and not the transaction. Titan builds partnerships one project at a time. Among their clients are Starbucks, Crumble, Cookie. Uh, Blake Pizza, Home Goods, 15 plus years experience based in Midlothian, Virginia, and contracted in Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So get on their website, TitanCGInc.com. That's TitanCGInc.com. Get in touch with Brad if you're in need of a general contractor that focuses on going above and beyond for their clients. That's Titan Construction Group, a proud sponsor of the JC and Morgan podcast. Mike. Listen up. This is for construction professionals, contractors, facility managers, or do-it-yourself homeowners. SitePro Rentals is ready to equip your upcoming project. 
We rent construction equipment for any size job. Boom and scissor lifts, telehandlers, skid steers, excavators, air compressors, generators, even small tools and equipment. Site Pro has you covered. If you are ready for better equipment rental, call Site Pro and rent from the local, friendly, easy to do business with equipment professionals. Call 972 Rent Now. That's 972 736 8669 to rent the newest equipment in the Atlanta market. Call 972 Rent Now or visit Site ProRentals.com. We're passionate about making sure that the Nest and Wild mattress is the best it can be. Made well and made right. Right here in Tupelo, Mississippi. So how can we do all that? Work. Hard work. And that means something. The Nest and Wild Mattress is a movement. It's a pride in where you come from and where you're going. So get comfortable. Because this movement is just beginning. back it is jc and morgan hope you're doing well tim brando will join us uh, in moments as he gets ready from his uh, palatial estate back in the state of louisiana so we're, we're covering all parts of the of the mighty united states here we got uh, jc in the midwest louisiana do we call that the deep south what do we call louisiana the, the deep south gulf coast yeah gulf coast deep south gulf gulf coast probably and I'm, I call I'm, I, football recruiting wise. I call it the I ten corridor, right? Which uh, if you go from Jacksonville, Florida to Houston, Texas, on the I ten corridor, you can find problem. how many all pro defensive linemen on that stretch of road. It's I insane. mean, yeah, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, uh, Pensacola, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, you know, Gulfport, Mississippi, every now and then. If you go right up the road in Mississippi, Hattiesburg area, there's a lot. Uh, and then you get into Louisiana, New Orleans, everywhere in Louisiana, you could throw a stone and hit a good defensive lineman. And then all the way into East Texas and Houston, there's just a ton of talent. When you look at, look at Nick Saban's LSU rosters early when he first got it rolling, loads of Louisiana and Houston area kids just made a, made a living – up and down I ten, so he. Uh, I, that's that's one of my favorite places to study study ball players. Is it's just just rich with defensive line freaks, and I I'm a, that's that's my favorite position to evaluate. So I love it. Well, it's why LSU. Like we all acknowledge Nick Saban's the goat, right? We don't say that about Les Miles, and we don't say that about Ed Orgeron, but but. They know where the talent is. They find it. They get it. Because, again, LSU doesn't have, like, Auburn's got Alabama. Florida's got Florida State Miami. South Carolina's got Clemson. But uh, schools like LSU, and I would say Georgia, because Georgia Tech ain't beating Georgia on, any, on anybody. Um, those two schools almost have monopolies in talent-rich yeah. states. That's a huge advantage. It's set up like Ohio State is. Ohio State, that's why they're great. And, People down south sometimes don't respect the talent in Ohio. It's literally the talent funnel for the entire Big Ten. Yeah. I mean, there are so many. I mean, and it's it's behind Georgia now as far as number of prospects go. Uh, Georgia's past Ohio, but it used to be fourth, not solid fifth. Uh, you go per capita, Louisiana, Mississippi are way, way up there. Um South Carolina's way up there. I mean, you're smaller. Alabama is uh, – Alabama probably has twice – they have 100,000 people less than South Carolina living in Alabama. Yeah. Twice the Division One prospects every year. Yeah. They, they Don't know why. The states, right. It's yeah, crazy. I mean, it, it's crazy. And then East Texas, uh, my buddy Jerry Hamilton and Bobby Burton, who cover the Texas Longhorns, check them out, by the way. They're on 
uh, YouTube. It's on Texas football. It's outstanding. Uh, daily stuff, kind of like me and Mike do here if you're a Longhorns fan. Um, they used to tell me the SEC begins in East Texas. Hmm. Like, that's where you start getting that that Southern talent. You know, the rest of the state's the rest of the state, but that East Texas area, they call it the Pine Curtain. Nice. <laughs> because it's like nothing but pine trees in that part of the state. So, it's uh, – so from the Pine Curtain to Jacksonville, man, I, if I were a recruiter, I'd live there. I would just yeah. – God, so much talent. Not a bad spot. By the way, you mentioned Ohio. It's, it's been a big uh, fertile recruiting ground for Mark Stoops in Kentucky. They're, they're kind of teaching those kids we are the gateway to the SEC. Brilliance, yeah, because yeah. they get the kids Michigan gets. And Michigan State used to get with under D'Antonio and Iowa and Wisconsin and, and those those really good football programs. Kentucky's been a pain. People talk about Kentucky being a pain for the SEC. They've been a pain for the Big Ten as far as uh, – Recruiting goes because he'll go get six, seven, or eight guys out of Ohio every single year. As we bring in our buddy Tim Brando, I want to remind everybody, uh, J.C. Morgan presented in part by Site Pro Rentals. When renting equipment, it's important to have local, easy-to-do business with friends in the industry. Reliable Reliability, service, and transparent pricing matter. You need to use Site Pro Rentals. Give them a call today, 972-RENT-NOW, 972 972- Seven three six eight six six nine at Site Pro Rentals for better equipment rental. Give them a call today. We have given a call to the mighty one, a friend <laughs> of the program, uh, ahead of Tom Tom Lugan Bill now by one. It's like a neck and neck race of two of our favorite guests here on the program. Tim Brando, kind enough to join us, and uh, Tim, I saw your tweet there. It, it has been a few months. I don't like to bother you. You and I are both during basketball. We're doing a couple games a week. It's it's nearly yeah. impossible to uh, set up times uh, during that time. But uh, I know you're not short on a lot of thoughts going on. Let's let's start there, shall we? Because I, you and I both, in addition to college football, we love college basketball. Uh, I know you were working the Big East tournament. You've seen the, you know the first two rounds of March Madness. Just uh, any prevailing thoughts on college hoops right now? Uh, unbelievable, just fantastic. Uh, the tournament is um you know it always delivers and despite what uh many in the media would have you believe uh <laughs> there are stars in college basketball okay there are stars uh in college basketball uh this notion that um and listen I, this isn't to i'm not being critical of the women's game i called some women's games this year uh, i've always uh, been a fan of women's basketball it has grown exponentially the Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese uh, game of a year ago, what South Carolina has done over time uh, to spread the wealth and to uh, actually, I believe, bring a lot of depth to the women's game has really helped it so much to so to the point now you're hearing uh, some, I think, some really good uh, uh, thoughts and editorials about getting these home games out of the women's game the first two weeks uh, for the first two rounds, I should say. And, and I think that's long since overdue. Because uh, some of these, you know, double-digit seeds now are pretty good uh, in the women's game. That was not the case. Okay, was not the case uh, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and certainly when I was starting out calling games. And um, uh, the coach at LSU, who's been in the news of late, uh, was a player in pigtails playing for Leon Barmore at Louisiana Tech. Uh, I'll never forget calling regionals at that time. Uh, for ESPN in the women's game, even called Cheryl Miller's win against Louisiana Tech out of wow. Long Beach, California in 1986 when they were en route to the finals. You know, Cheryl did not win that championship game, but she got there and she had to beat a Louisiana Tech team to get there. Um, you know, that at that particular time, um, Leon Barmore had a, a dynasty there. They had won AIAW titles, the NCAA title in 82, had lost uh, the game to Carolina, which was a a buzzer beating game that a lot of people remember too. So, um, but, but the women's game is now being pushed by some in the media to such a point that they'd have you believe that the men's game is inferior. Right. <laughs> and that is a joke. Right. So the, the men's game does have stars. It's just the NBA doesn't recognize a Zach Eady because he's not a stretch five. <laughs> it's yeah. like, really? He's not a stretch five. Gee, I don't think Shaquille was either. And if you've seen Zach Eady play, that's a massive body to try to get around. And uh, he's got people hanging all over him. He's the best player in college, and I don't give a damn what he does at the NBA level. I don't watch that league. 
I think it's an awful game. And uh, so as, as long as they're playing in college and they're really good, I call them stars. I do. Yeah. And uh, I think the college game – I, I actually thought there would be more upsets in the second round. My my bracket does have all of its four teams that I picked in my final four are still alive, but I only got nine out of the sixteen, which tells you that it was a surprising uh, was a, that, that some of the heavier seed teams did hold on and win uh, in round number two. I, I thought Grand Canyon could beat Alabama. I really did, and they almost did, and yeah. they almost did, but. Um, and I certainly thought James Madison would be more representative, you know, in their game with Duke. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had them winning the game in my bracket, but they didn't. They got blown out. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, but I, th I certainly think the tournament is in great shape. If you don't mind, I want to add something yeah. because I heard JC talking about uh, East Texas and uh, in the Pines. Okay. Texas in the Pines. In 1973, I was the play-by-play -play voice of the Pine Tree Pirates, a class 3A school in Longview, Texas. They weren't the Longview Lobos, but they were the next biggest program in that city. And they played in the same uh, district with the Marshall Mavericks and so many of the other great towns. I think mm -hmm. they might be 4 or 5A now, JC, but uh, you're absolutely right. And that those were in the days, uh, fellas, when I was playing baseball, and we would go over to East Texas to play in Longview. And I played an American Legion tournament my sophomore year, believe it or not, where David Clyde was pitching against my team. Uh, now, I, I didn't have to bat against him, thank God. I was just a sophomore. I came in as a, an extra glove uh, for defensive purposes, right, <laughs> late in the game. But just a few months later, uh, after David Clyde was pitching against us, he was pitching for a team out of the Houston area uh, in a tournament in Longview, uh, an American Legion tournament. A few months later, I was watching his second start with the Texas Rangers when his ill-fated career started too soon uh, as a first-round pick for then-owner uh, Bob Short, uh, who brought the Senators in. And if you recall, back in those days, um, they, he just wanted to get a gate. He wanted people to show up. So, But Clyde pitched against Al Kaline, Willie Horton, Norm Cash, Jim Northrup, all those guys. I'm there watching him pitch at the old Turnpike Stadium, which was, you know, the Arlington Stadium, which was a double-A park in the Texas League. They mm -hmm. turned into a big league park for a short time before they built uh, the new stadiums there. But um, what a thrill that was. You know, there were great athletes. And the, and, and the thing I remember most, J.C., about going to those facilities, even for baseball, okay, was mm -hmm. they were like college campuses, okay? Oh, that's, yeah, they like a ton of money. They still are. And they still are. Yeah. You know, you go to a place like Katy, Texas, and you see some of those places. Uh, but even in Longview, Marshall, uh, you know, and by the way, you drive through places like Hallsville and Gladewater and Center, Texas, which is in South Central, home of the Rough Riders. Uh, even down to Bo Beaumont. I was a high school junior with my dad after I did Neville games in Monroe was such a thrill because it was just fantastic. And there. And it's fertile territory for LSU, too. They've always recruited well in the East Texas area. Yeah, there's just a different, different level of athlete there. I mean, sure, there's talent in the Metroplex and, and yeah. greater Houston. Even even over in West Texas, there, there's plenty of talent. But yeah. the, your, your SEC-type athletes – yeah, or yeah, behind the pine curtain, so they say because there's pine trees, it's <laughs> they call it the pine curtain. Behind yeah, Bob, Bob, Bobby, I don't know if you know Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton, who two recruiting guys like me in their background, but they, they taught oh, me don't, that. I don't know, them, and but I, I'm sure, I'm sure if I met them, I would remember them. Because oh yeah, like are, they're lifers. I didn't mean to get off the subject of your question. No, it's great though. I, but I was eavesdropping while I was in your waiting room. And I overheard that conversation brought back a lot of memories. Well, we, we learned you were the Raphael Belliard of your time. Defensive <laughs> glove replacement. Uh, I did not Low know this. lefty with occasional power. Can't go <laughs> deep. Will never get a leg hit. <laughs> there's, a, there's a role for that in, in the specialization Absolutely. of baseball. Yeah. I'm not sure where exactly it is. Well, you, and I, I almost forgot this, that. Because for, for a lot of people, women's basketball d didn't even exist 10 years ago. And now, like you said, it, it's almost the overcorrection. Like, it's okay to get behind women's basketball. Yeah. If you're trying to compare it to the men's game, you're going to start getting in trouble. Yeah. I, 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 and that's happening across the board. Oh, I know it. I know it. And and we understand what goes into that. Right. You right. and I have been in 
this business long enough uh, and on the TV side to understand mm -hmm. some of the motivation uh, mm -hmm. to, to push narratives such as, well, it's a better game. Well, that, that's your opinion, but not necessarily. Right. It's, it's more fundamentally yeah. sound. No, it's absolutely not more fundamentally sound. Yeah. Uh, I, I All my friends say they're more excited about the women's tournament than the men's. Okay, well, the ratings will be out soon enough. And if you want to convince me, other than Caitlin Clark, that the ratings are going to be better, uh, good luck with that because the men's yeah. tournament is a phenomenon. The women's tournament is starting to open up eyes. Yeah. And again, yeah. I'm like you, I'm all for it. But where I was going to go with that is you can speak as intelligently about this as anyone. You go back far enough. And I mentioned that name the other day on another show, Cheryl Miller. Right. And I'm old enough. I mean, as a kid, but I remember Greatest Cheryl Miller. Greatest player of all time, by the way. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Uh, so you've seen Caitlin Clark, obviously. She yeah. was all over your network this year, and it was right. instant ratings gold. Sure. I've never seen anybody play the game like Caitlin Clark on the women's level ever. No. And, and I, and I, not I, at that I, position, and not at that right. position. You know, she's like a Steph Curry, Pistol Pete, all wrapped up in the world. Yes, water. yes. Oh, yeah. So I get I don't think that's a hype train. That's a true no. phenomenon. Like I know yeah. I know analysts in our business, Tim, that spent their own hard earned money to travel out to the Midwest just because they wanted to say oh, I saw yeah. Caitlin Clark playing per, playing right. person. So but you would still give the edge to Miller was more dominating. We know that, but given the, the competition's much better. And Caitlin Clark is the best shooter in the women's game of all. I don't right. think that's even debatable, right? No. In terms of what where she's hitting logo threes. So where where what is this phenomenon to you as somebody who's broadcasted women's games going all the way back to the 80s? Well, she's in a position to do something that Cheryl couldn't do. All right. And that's not Cheryl's fault. It's because there's more media now. Okay. Sure. We have the, the there's more opportunities to spotlight Caitlin Clark. That's actually the biggest difference between her and, and Pete. Uh, when the comparisons to Pete came up, uh, and by the way, I had no problem with it, you know, through the years. <laughs> I got into debates uh, when I was in the studio, going all the way back to my days at ESPN, and certainly uh, even at CBS, I would voice my opposition to it. But it's a byproduct of what the NCAA does. You know, they list the records among men and women in the same places. Okay, right. so they compare that, and that shouldn't happen. No. Uh, when the Pat Summit passing Mike Shashevsky thing came up, I, I, I just had problems with it because the games are different. The competition level was different, uh, and I loved Pat, and I called all of her games. I did those UConn – we called it Title IX Weekend on CBS. I would call the <laughs> UConn-Tennessee game, which was an annual event, you know, between her and Gino when, you know, so many of her stars were playing, um, going back to Shamequa Hostlaw especially. Um, mm. And I did a lot of those games with Rebecca. I did uh, – Carol Lawson actually worked with me once. Um uh, it, it was they they're great they love basketball i love basketball too but the reality is uh pistol pete maravich when he was playing was uh like bigfoot okay yeah. you heard about him but you never saw him unless mm -hmm. you were in the sec they had a single game sec on tbs game uh, that was eddie einhorn's syndicated network back in the day this is pre-raycom pre-jefferson pilot TVS, which was Eddie Einhorn's idea, which helped put all, even men's basketball on NBC, was part of a regional package that Einhorn's company worked out with NBC for regular season games right after the tournament became a big deal in 1968 after the Alcindor-UCLA-Houston uh, uh, game with the Big E Elvin Hayes in 1968. Well, uh, Dean Meminger and Marquette on in the NIT in the round of 16 played against Pistol Pete in 1970, McGuire, Al McGuire wanted to play in the NIT rather than the NCAA. He turned down the NCAA to play in the NIT because he had so many right. kids from New York mm -hmm. and he knew they were going to send him out west to play because he was an independent, didn't want to do that. So he went and played in that game. I think that's probably the most viewers that Pete had for any one individual game that he ever played in as a collegian. Well, uh, Caitlin Clark's been exposed nationally since, you know, for two years now. You know, on games that everybody could see. That wasn't true when Pete was playing. Pete was a guy that brought the gate in the SEC. People lined up outside all these gyms that would normally never go to an SEC game. Uh, I saw him in 1967 at the John Parker Ag Center uh, on Highland Road and in, in, uh, on the campus at LSU as a freshman. And the place emptied out after the freshman game.
because Pete couldn't play in the varsity game. So he was a phenomenon, but he was not an exposed star to the country on TV. She's been there. Okay. Right. And, and Cheryl, similar story. The few games that were on were normally tournament games back then that the NCAA had on ESPN. And I got, I was fortunate enough to get to do quite a few of those games. She was an inside outside talent that you could argue. I mean, she, Reggie Miller would even tell you she would, they would play outside. She right. beat, she beat right. with regularity. Okay. In, in games one-on-one. -on -one. And um, so she was the best overall player on the women's side I ever saw. Again, her timing, the calendar just wasn't as good to her as Caitlin was, but I thought the confluence of the LSU story, the Angel Reese attitude, mm -hmm. uh, South Carolina being upset by Iowa, the mm -hmm. way that they were by Caitlin, you know, shooting the lights out, all of that really jettisoned the women's game last year in ways that even those Tennessee UConn games could not. Right. Uh, I mean, they just they just could not. So I think the women's game is in a, a great position, and they really do need to get away from these home courts for the first two rounds. But the reason they did it was because of money, greed. That, sure. So there, that was really the only way they could make the money because they weren't getting the same television revenue, uh, anywhere close to the same television revenue that uh, the men were. But now they got a new deal, and they're going to be on for quite some time as long as the NCAA is uh, still in business anyway. And um, <laughs> and that's going to – so I think that's going to continue making the women's game great. And there's a young lady playing at Texas right now, a freshman, was on the under-18 um, uh, United States team last year in the World Cup, Madeline Booker. Her, her dad played at Southern Miss. I called his games years ago in the old Metro Conference. Uh, Madeline Booker is, is – She's a star, man. She's she's a she's a Magic Johnson type of star that's got great size, can play all five positions, and she's going to be the next big thing uh, in the women's game. Coach Schaefer has got uh, got her, and they lost their point guard this year um, very early. Their team leader in All America, and they they still you know won their league, and and I think are going to be a dynamite team, and might might even win the whole thing this year. So keep an eye on her. There are a lot of really good great potentially great players in the women's game but again we got we got these riders in 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 the northeast and particularly major cities that look at the college men's game now and say well they just don't score enough you know these guys are <laughs> these guys are just not scoring well hell they play defense in college you know right. they, they actually play defense and they call fouls okay? yeah they don't do that in the nba i'm so so this you're, you're looking at a, a a really slanted media view uh, that's negative about the men's game and so promoting from a from a politically correct point of view is on overload where the women are concerned so much so that they're using the women's game to diss the men's and that that's role. right it's robin peter to pay paul and it's uh because they it, just don't like college ball at all i mean well they just down their noses at the college colleges and especially the men timmy b we, we we've talked about this going back to the COVID era I, I, that whole time frame shined a light on the people that cover the sport you and think? where where they're coming from. It yeah. it I learned a lot from people that I respect and read and listen to, and it's like, whoa, is that really is that your viewpoint of the world yeah. and and the viewpoint of yeah. college athletics is so bad and yeah. like it's just like if if you're that miserable, go cover the weather, cover <laughs> cover politics, cover anything else. Like nobody's yeah. got a gun to your head where well, you have and to. That, and that's it. They're injecting politics into their coverage of sports. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. They use, and they use uh, the gender deal. Yeah. Uh, no question. To, to, to fuel that. They no do. question. And by the way, we, we just scored title nine points because we talked far more about women's basketball than we did men's <laughs> basketball in this opening segment. And I will yeah. I will pay off your pistol Pete thing with with one point. And and, and again, if, if I wish, you know, if I was older, I would have if, if I could pick like, OK, where do I want to be? Well, I want to see Pistol Pete. I want to see Babe Ruth. I want to see Willie Mays. I want to see right. 
Will Chamberlain. But Pistol Pete would be right there at the at the top of the list. Yeah, I'm and just for, a little bit older than you. So I, I know you you got me beat by a few years, and you I actually got, got to see, see him Mays. in person. Yeah, I, I got to but see one thing Willie I Mays. one awesome. thing that bothers me, Tim, is when they talk about Pistol Pete. Well, he was just a phenomenon in college. He played for his dad. He played in a different era. Blah blah. He won a scoring title in the NBA, folks. Like, look yeah. it up. It's he, yeah. he he didn't forget how to score no. when he got to the pros. He had he had some issues in the pros that are well documented, but uh, that's for another time. All right. right. I can't think of a better way to segue into football because here's here's the correlation with the college basketball tournament. Uh, we've spoken a number of times on this show about the last time we had you on. You uh, rightfully predicted that don't count on this 12-team playoff staying at 12. Within mm -hmm. a couple of years, it'll be – I think your number was 16. As it right. stands now, it's 14, so you were pretty much on the ball there. And sure enough, there's always the, the yearly talk about the college basketball tournament this time of year. Well, is 68 really enough? Let's go to 72. Let's go to 80. Let's go to 96. So where where you stand, uh, wh how do you see all this coming down the pike? Because we are clearly in a period of radical change of how both these sports are run right. and going to be run. Get into the Timmy B crystal ball uh, and and wax poetic about what we're looking at the next few years. Well, I think the only reason the 14 now, Mike, is uh, the preeminent thought on the football side is because the company you work for is willing to pay $1.3 billion, okay, to have total control of all of it, mm -hmm. okay? And by the way, at $1.3 billion to have total control of all of it, you're not going to make any money. You're going to lose money. <laughs> okay, but but you're going to keep it. It's going to be exclusively yours. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Disney, <laughs> you want to do that? Go get you some. That's what they're going to do. But I still believe that 16 is where they'll ultimately land, meaning in two years when they have to do the deal, I think the, the push for 16 will probably overtake the 14. Mm -hmm. All right. And either the company you work for will be willing to pay more and lose more or they will sublease some of it out and there'll be more than one carrier. Right. Okay. Because they'll have to do that because they can't afford not to. All mm -hmm. right. I think that's, what's going to happen now. I know, I, I know who I work for and I know people are going to oh, Brando, you're just, no, no, <laughs> I'm just telling you the business end of this folks. Okay. The business end of this is if you want more money, uh, 16 is the way to go and you probably need to do it right away before you do this next deal, because if you don't do it, then they're going to be stuck at 14 for a long time. And I think that's an uncomfortable number. I think having the top four teams playing uh, the opening week is going to actually bring you some ratings. These quarterfinal games with 12, you'll, you'll see it. You'll, the, you'll see the, in the first two years, which is the last two years of this current contract, those, those games between five and 12, six and 11, you know, eight and nine and seven and 10, they're not going to get ratings. And the reason they're not going to get ratings is because they're, they're up against NFL games, uh, you know, where they're having to situate them on the calendar in terms of where the games are going to be played, when they're going to be played. In that time of December, um, people aren't going to tune in for those games. Uh, you and I will, but the, the, the ratings will not justify the rights fees in my view. Okay. Once they learn that, they're going to figure out that the opening week, they don't need the top four teams sitting out, getting a buy. They mm -hmm. need them playing at home because those are the teams that are going to bring you the big numbers. All right? If we could no matter, take no matter the outcome of the game, no yeah. matter if it's a blowout or not, those are the numbers. Those are the teams that are going to bring you the, the biggest numbers. So that's my view of where we are in football. Uh, and I think that um, the push away from 12 to just 14 – was something that, that Tony Petiti wanted to see happen. And I think Greg Sankey understood that. And the two of them, you know, coalesced at that number for the time being. And ESPN amazingly, amazingly, in my in my view, was willing to pay over $50 million per game. That is, I mean, $50 million per game. And your top four teams aren't even playing the first week. That's that's an amazing number to me. But they, they're, they're willing to do it, so God bless them. You know, go get you some. I, I just think it's uh, I think it's too Herculean a number for you to meet financially for that to be a good deal 
for the rights holder. So, but we'll see. Now, on the on the basketball side, Mike, uh, I think what happened this year, particularly to the Big East, with Providence, St. John's, and Seton Hall. Seton Hall was thirteen and seven in the league. Uh, they beat they beat UConn. Okay, uh, they beat Marquette, and they didn't get in. You know, and the last team that played UConn a close game was Patino's team that was on a run at the end of the year. They only lost by five in the Big East tournament. <laughs> I know it was in Madison Square Garden, but that was a hell of a performance, and they didn't get in either. Virginia got in and just laid a complete egg. Now, they're, they're fortunate that the ACC went 8-0 and other than them in the tournament to kind of raise the bar back up for the Atlantic Coast Conference. I think they're the story. They're, that league is the story of the tournament so far to have four teams in the Sweet 16. But the Big East isn't far behind with its three teams, you know, the top tier of those, uh, you know, Connecticut um, and then and then Creighton and Marquette are all in it. And I've got them all in my final four. I picked it right away. I like the draws for Connecticut, uh, actually more for Creighton and Marquette than I do for Connecticut. I think Connecticut's got the harder track to take. But when that happened and the and the and the uh, uh, head of the committee um, came out. I believe he's the president of Grambling, if memory serves me correctly. I believe that's right. Or it might be the athletic director of Grambling, who was the committee chair. He came out and said, we had five stolen bids. Five. Well, you know what I know, that that's an aberration. Normally, it's one or two bids that are stolen. This year, it was five. Well, you know, I can defend the committee to a point, because that is rare, that five teams would have bids taken away from them because of upsets in power conferences in the in the tournaments but what that does is it fuels greg sankey's thought process uh, the commissioner of the sec who's saying we need we need more teams out of the power conferences in this tournament and i guarantee you that val ackerman is going to be in lockstep with him given the pressure that's brought from her presence i mean my god this was the second best league in the country all year long and Sure, Connecticut was at a higher level. So was so was Creighton, and so was Marquette. But these other teams that were on or inside or just outside the bubble the whole last month of the season, they deserve to be in. Okay, particularly when you saw six Mountain West teams get in, Virginia get in. Uh, so I think that's going to just automatically make eighty the number. I think we'll see that wow. as soon as next year. I think mm. I think that's going to happen because the Power Conference commissioners want it. And now, after what happened to the Big East, I guarantee you Val Ackerman wants it. And, but T.D. will uh, want it, too. Sure, sure. So I think I don't like the idea. I love it the way it is. I, I don't mm -hmm. think college basketball needs expansion. I think the right. conference tournaments do matter. This is proof that, that they really matter a lot, what happened this past year. But I think that, um, you know, the people that are in charge right now are, are saying we're not getting out of this what we're putting into it. We need to get more revenue for our programs. And um, I think we'll see them go to 80 right away. I do. So you've got three big East teams in the final four. I do. I do. And like I 1985. Think, and I think yes. And I think they're legit picks. I mean, I'm not a house boy. I, I, people are saying, well, oh, Brando, we saw the typical stuff, right? Uh, when I put my, my brackets out. Yeah. You know where your bread's buttered. I saw you got that nice uh, Big East media award <laughs> named after Jim O'Connell, Brando. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got three Big East teams in. No, I yeah, just like the draw, JC. I love their draws. It's uh, legit. No, Creighton, I mean, if you don't stop them from shooting, you're not going to beat them. I mean, they well, are. I mean, they Oregon, are. Oregon did the best job of defending them. If yeah. Anybody, and they still willed their way to a win. They got lucky there to win Good that luck, game. yeah, beating you know, those I guys. Mean, they've had their stinker. They've had their iron unkind game. Trust me when I tell you, they can shoot the lights out. Offensively, they are as difficult to scout as any team there is out there. And if there's one guy, one team that can handle Zach Eady, it's Creighton. Why? Ryan Kalkbrenner. He's the defensive player of the year in the Big East. He's a rim runner. He's gotten much stronger. Unlike last year, this kid can play 37, 38 minutes now. And the other thing about Creighton is they defend, but they don't foul. They don't get in mm. foul trouble. Ever. 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 And, and, and McDermott's an outstanding coach. They should have been really in the Final is. Four last year. They had San Diego State on the ropes. One second and one bad call away from being there last year. Yeah. And so that's why you saw the emotion from them. And I think they almost 
were too tight to win that game because getting over that hump uh, here to make sure that they got back to the, the round of 16 was such a big deal to them. But I love that draw for them. And, and Marquette, to me, is the perfect team to handle Houston. Houston was exposed by Texas A&M because they – they forced them to, to to defend hard and foul. They fouled four of their guys out. All right, Shed's sitting there. And by the way, another reason to love the, the men's basketball tournament. You know, hello, how do you do, Ryan Elvin? Fourth year walk-on senior has to come in to replace Shed, who fouls out with 18 seconds left. And who's got to make the free throw to ice it? But mm -hmm. that kid, right? Thank God he had two shots and it wasn't a one and one. <laughs> and barely, oh, yeah, barely played oh, all year. Oh, I'd have felt so bad. bad. He shot four free throws all year, and now yeah. he's got to make this shot. In what other sport does that happen, guys? In None. what other sport? I mean, that's no. what makes March Madness the best. You know, it really does. Ne never disappoints. Uh, I, 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 I mean. I was laughing at some of the, we don't need to address the, the, the critic. Like there's some people that clearly went on a mission this year. Like, okay, I am going to blank on the NCAA men's tournament any way possible. Yeah. And so if there's upsets, well, then they don't like the matchups in the sweet 16. Right. If it's, if it's chalkish, which this yeah. year has been more chalkish than usual yeah. with all the ones and two still around. Well, we didn't have enough upsets. Well, <laughs> you're not going to be happy. No matter. You're going to find no. a way to chip away at it's a what pro, is it's a pro mentality it's the guys that are following the nba and they're all over this and and to some extent look i'm a big fan of the cbs turner collaboration my last years there starting in 2011 was when it began that was the first year that was the year the butler did it again and mm -hmm. uh, jaminski and i were together when they had that unbelievable uh, win over pitt yeah. uh, which was a number one seed out in dc I love the Turner CBS collaboration. Now we can see all the games. You got the clicker mm -hmm. in your hand. You can go wherever you want to go, whenever you want to go. And if you don't do that, if you're not, then you're just not, that's on you. I mean, you, you've you got the right to go to any game you want, whenever you want. You know, up until that time, I was just hopeful that the guys in New York knew that I had the best game. Please bring most of the country to my game, will you? You know, in those years between 96 and 2010, that's the way the tournament was on national television. So the complaints were many back then, and some of them were justified, okay? But with with this collaboration with Turner and CBS, there's no reason for that. I think there are times, okay, when I grimace a little bit, when I, when I see or I hear uh, uh, some of the guys that are NBA guys say, gee, you know, they're just – and by the way, you know, in, bas in, in, in the NBA, they'd move this ball to half court and, and 3.5 would be plenty of time. It's, I, 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 I don't need to hear that. I know, right. I know the difference between yeah. there. Only then do I grimace a little bit and have a problem right. with it. But hell, that, that was true with bowl games years ago, Mike, when NBC would be doing, um, and I love Don Cricky, but every now and then Don would say, remember in the college game, it's just one foot, <laughs> not two, you know. Yeah. Thanks, Don. But, I mean, we have to put up with that a little bit. But I get overall, it. I think what CBS and Turner have done has been outstanding. I'm a big fan of all the guys that are calling these games. Yes. I'm I'm standing up in my house cheering for Andrew Catalan, who who replaced me uh, when I left the tournament in 2013, and he's a good guy. He uses my stats guy, Ethan Cooperson, and uh, he. You know, he's a. I'm so happy he and Steve Lapis are getting to do a regional final. Lapis is great. He's love, fantastic. I love. And, and I, the two of them work really well together. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I'm able to, and I do. I I'll sometimes will text these guys in the middle of a game, you know, saying, "Man, this is you're killing it." You know that I, I'm a big fan of this tournament. I'm a big fan of the guys that are getting to do the tournament, uh, and I don't miss. Uh, doing the first two rounds. Now, this week I miss. You know, week yeah. two, that was special. When I got to do teams that are punching a ticket to the Final Four, there's part of me that wishes I, I still was there. But that first two rounds, now I get to enjoy it like everybody else. When I was, you know, doing the, the first two rounds all those years, Mike, you didn't have time to enjoy it. You were so busy trying to get your notes together on eight mm -hmm. teams Right. Four games in one day, and you were lucky if you knew two of those teams uh, when you went to the practices. 
it was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. And when it was over, it was like, wow, that was fast. Gee whiz. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if you didn't get a great game, if you, if you had, if you had six bad games, you really kind of felt hollow inside. And you know, then you try you know, to flush, flush a thousand pages of game notes out of your brain <laughs> so you can remember where you put your car keys. That's how I've lived my yeah, life. People yeah. marvel at what I can remember uh, on the sports stage from hey, 20, 30 years ago, but yeah, I can't tell a, you where my a, keys here's an are. old board of mine for Michigan State with Kalen Lucas. There's an old board of mine. Oh, wow. From old school. 2010, that year, Corey Lucius hit the shot to beat Gravis Vasquez and uh, Maryland in the round in the second round for it was an unbelievable finish. Is that Appling I see on there, Luke Appling. Luke Appling, yep. yep. Keith Appling. Uh, Draymond Green. Green. Draymond Green. Draymond Green. Dollars, Kalen Lucas. Corey Lucius. Uh, what, what was Draymond averaging? I know you got it on your board. Adrian what, were, Payne. what was Draymond uh, averaging that year? Let's see. Get yeah, get the glass because uh, <laughs> you didn't type it out like we do no, now. I was all now. Yeah, you're now, doing now all I, manual. Now, now, yeah, it was all manual. Back I don't then. trust my handwriting to, to do that. Neither I write like a I. serial killer. <laughs> Neither do I. About three quarters of my stuff now is typed out. For oh, I got to do that. I yeah. receive, but I did it all back in those and all color coded back in those days. It's a, it's a thing was of beauty. averaging 12.4 uh, points, eight, eight and a half rebounds, 117 assists, 67 turnovers. 52, st 52 steals, played 29 and a half minutes a game. Uh, and who, who would have thought? I mean, he's going to be borderline Hall of Fame when you when you yeah. look at his NBA resume when it's all said and done. Yeah. Uh, when, besides the, the knucklehead factor that, that yeah, I had Ryder's cramp. Night. Have, you know, after doing those boards for eight teams. Oh heck! I mean, <laughs> you you know what I do now for football? I make a phone oh. call to Tony Britt, and I've got a beautiful two deep, and uh, you know, I I can't draw all those things out anymore. It's it's yeah. it's too much. Um, let, let's transition back to football for a moment, yeah. and let's put your uh, put your gypsy costume back on, get the crystal ball back out as you continue to forecast the future of college mm -hmm. athletics. The ACC, the Florida State Clemson saga that that yeah. is never ending. I it's gotten to the point where it's it's so legalese now. I, it makes my head hurt to read the stories. I can't even Mine digest too. it all. Mine so, too. so what are we? It's clear. I mean, I made the analogy. It's like if you love someone and they don't love you back, it doesn't matter how many incentives you put in there, and you give her roses, and you give her candies, and you promise her exotic vacations to Exuma. Mm -hmm. At, at some point, they're going to be like, I don't love you. I don't want to be with you. I'm moving out. And that's clearly what Florida State and Clemson want to do here. But there's also a, a rather ironclad contract through 2036. Are we looking at just negotiating a number here to make everybody uh, somewhat I think happier? we're looking at a. I think we're looking at a, an arbitrator to adjudicate it, ultimately. I, I, that's what I see. Um or, you know, can a judge come in here and say that this this uh, grant of rights is not binding? That's what they're hoping for. Yeah. I mean, that's what they're hoping for. And if that doesn't happen, then I think the pressure could still be so great, though, even after that, that, um, you know, ultimately it, it may come down to what, you know, a guy, honestly, it may come down to what a guy like Burke Magnus decides to do, you know. Head of ESPN. Yeah. Of. Yeah. And by the way, I'm a fan of his. Burke is a guy that I've gotten to know a little bit, you know, from distance, you know, in this business. Um, and I think uh, most of the people in college athletics think a lot of him. And I understand why. Um, during the time in which I was out at CBS and before I went to Fox and uh, there was potential and even a story published that said I was coming to the SEC network. Um, I got to, uh, understand and know what his role was at that time a little bit more, you know, and when I did the conference tournaments for Raycom and Jefferson pilot, those ACC tournaments, occasionally he'd be there and we just talk. I, 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 he's a, he's a really good college basketball and college football mind. So it may ultimately come down to that too. Just a business, you know, similar to maybe the role that, that, uh, ESPN played in the formation of the Longhorn network to keep the big 12 intact. You know, back in 2000, what was it, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it may come down to something like that, ultimately, Mike. I, 
you know, I, I think that um, if the courts don't act on this to the liking of the Florida State people, I, I see where Clemson jumped on board. But I think they're so adamant and they're pushing this so hard that, um, you know, some calls can be made. And I do think there are enough takers, um, particularly with teams like Virginia and North Carolina, uh, to potentially move Big Ten to make a Florida State Clemson uh, de facto move to the, the SEC happen. It, it, would all, all, it would all come down to that. <clears throat> and this relationship that's been built between Sankey and Petiti that's been discussed is real. And so, you know, who knows, you know, what might happen. That's why, that's why I believe jury's out on whether they'll stay at 14 and not go to 16 by the time we see the ratings on 12 teams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, well, in football. Yeah. Same, uh, same sort of story. Same sort of sure. story. But these are the people that are really governing the future of the game. In a lot of ways, I've been tell I've been saying that you know like, when people were focused on like the Dartmouth case, like that doesn't move the needle. What moves the needle are the no. two p most powerful people in the sport right now, which is Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti. Uh, it's not right. even there's not even a close second. The these and, guys and the are way, kind of your de facto czars that you're always calling for, Tim. I mean, yeah. we, in a way, they yeah. are the czars. And by the way, they're listening. Okay, they're listening. For instance, and I and I say this because when. Um, those stories were coming out that either Thamel or Heather Denich were writing about what was happening with the rights and um, then what the, the governance was going to be. And if you remember that story that, that came out, and I don't know why it was leaked out. I don't know why they leaked this stuff out, but they do. I don't think it's Petiti and I don't think it's Sankey, but somebody talks, whether it's the presidents or whomever, uh, the people that are following this closely, whether the Brett McMurphys of the world, they'll find out that uh, the SEC and the Big Ten <clears throat> want to have three teams guaranteed. Remember that when that came oh, yeah. out? Well, that 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 was <laughs> that's not a leak that they wanted out, and it looked really bad. So they got rid of it, which right. they needed to, because the metrics are already on their side. Sure. They're gonna get three. <laughs> you just don't need to put it in print. Minimum. You know, you just don't need to. Put, the metrics are already on your side. The metrics were on Alabama's side with Florida State when they were 13 and 0. Okay, the metrics were on their side. So you don't mm -hmm. need to to just uh, put it in print that well Big 10 and SEC get 3, Big 12 gets 2. You don't need to do all that. Just make but them I, all at larges and you'll get your teams in regardless. One thing that that is in print and, and in indelible ink is that they are going to get the greater share. I mean, it's right there. Yeah. 29%, 29%, yeah. then the big then the ACC, the Big 12, right. and then you know, you got Oregon State and Washington State, they they finally mustered into into seven figures, they're a little over a million. Mm -hmm. Um but the, it it begs the question like how are these other schools going to compete? And this to me causes the mad scramble for Florida State and and Clemson to get out. How mm -hmm. are you going to compete? when your SEC Big Ten uh, brethren are making yeah. double, triple, whatever as much money as you right. are every and that, year. That's what I'm saying. That's what makes the Florida State um, – that's what makes the Florida State case valid, okay? That's what makes – it almost makes the case for them, okay? Right. I mean, it really does. So once a judge uh, – uh, once a court says, you know what, this this deal – Really, it's a, I, I don't know that this grant of rights really does hold up because ultimately, and this is like the elephant in the room, fellas, the elephant in the room here and keep an eye on this moving forward. All right. The NCA, why do you think they got this NCA women's deal put together so quickly? It wasn't just because Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese had this epic final and undefeated South Carolina went down and the numbers mushroomed it. The reason they did it was because they knew that if they didn't pony up the extra money now for the women's game, the NCAA, they were going to lose what little opportunity they, they had for another cash cow to go along with the men's basketball tournament. Those two things are all the NCAA has. Mm -hmm. That's all they have. They're not worth anything without the men's basketball tournament. And now, to a lesser extent, uh, financially, but to quite a bit of an extent in terms of their public domain, the women's tournament. So they got that deal rushed through. ESPN ponied up for that. All right. 
But when you look at those pressures that are coming to the NCAA now with regard to everything that's going on with the, you know, you've been operating outside the antitrust uh, act, you've been outside the Sherman Act, you've been the NCAA is in such peril that the potential of both the men's tournament and the women's tournament contracts being ruled null and void because the NCAA is 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 operating <laughs> illegally exists. I mean, it, it exists. You talk to a lot of lawyers and they'll tell you that the potential that the NCAA is done soon uh, it exists. And, it, and, and I've been saying this for a long time that college football needs to get away totally. Okay. Totally from the NCAA. I think operating the lesser Olympic non-revenue producing sports and basketball is still worthwhile for the NCAA because they've done a good job with it. Okay. The men's tournament is a huge success, huge success. And I think it's the best three weeks in sports. The women's tournament is gathering great momentum to be just the same, but that's the only reason for the NCAA to be in existence. Okay. They're an event planner, but that, yeah, football, all they've done with football is screw it up. All they've done is screw it up in football. And I think that the leaders, particularly Sankey and Petiti, know this. So getting away from it entirely is on the docket for the not immediate future, but long-term future. And if that were to happen, the chances of not just the NCAA losing football, but all of it, okay, all of it exists. And we could have open season again, and there could be new biddings for the men's tournament and the and the women's tournament. The NCAA the thing, it could blow. The NCAA could be blown up entirely. I don't think there's any question. And you know, the Tennessee case, just another example of the NCAA in a courtroom getting dumped yeah. on. It's like at a, the scene of a homicide, where the <laughs> the, the, the state police. So the, the guy gets tapped on the shoulder. The FBI says, no, we have this one. And then the NCAA well, is like Paul Blart, the mall cop, going, yeah. well, wait a minute. What about me? I have power. No, you, no, sir. We've got this one. Yeah. You stay over there. Well, well, JC, you and Mike tell me, in what other in what other realm has the Supreme Court ever been united on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean. And they make quick, quick know, work of it, too. The NCAA, yeah. <laughs> the the courts are not NCAA friendly at right no. now, and it, it doesn't matter what your who you're appointed by, who you are. They don't want to hear it. I mean, at all. Right. I mean, look, look that that Tennessee and Virginia s lawsuit that they lost recently basically says, okay, you're free to go if you're an NIL collective, you're free to go recruit players, absolutely, and offer them money. And pay for play. They, they, they literally told the NCAA, yeah, you can't do anything about NIL pay for play at all because NIL is a separate thing from that side that you're, 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 inter, you're uh, interfering with free enterprise. Bruce How Pearl's do you fight attorney, that? Bruce Pearl's attorneys told the NCAA through that FBI investigation, up yours. Do what? Hire Bruce Pearl's attorney. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll need, <laughs> there's all kinds of strong ass deals being made now. You yeah, know? I mean, I mean it's, it's just uh, ahead of his time. I mean, yeah, he, yeah. Looks, he looks prophetic now. Okay. No. Will okay. Wade, prophet. <laughs> yeah. Nope. So, he'll he'll be mean, in a power, he'll be in a power six uh, job here before yeah, I just look at He will be at Magnesis. Yeah, and he's he will be. worth every penny that Magnesis is paying him. That right album, without question. Without <laughs> yeah. question. Uh, Tim, if we had uh, a salary to give our, our guests, you'd be worth every penny. Instead, <laughs> you're gracious enough to do this. Uh, based on your own merits, and uh, maybe we'll send you a bowl of a watch like they used to do to Braves uh, players of the game. Uh, yeah, gosh, I remember, I remember reading that card once. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You've read them all. You've read them all. You've done uh, it all, and you're always uh, Greg knocking Blouser it out of the park for with being us. Our guest here on the Better Up Show. <laughs> yes, here's a bowl of a watch for you and the family to enjoy. It's a little something for the time and effort. Uh, <laughs> Timmy B, again, can't thank you enough. Uh, people always rave about uh, whenever you're on the show. They love the time. Uh, you get to enjoy some time now and, and watch more of March Madness. And before you know it, we'll be talking college football again. We'll have you back on before that for sure. And I really appreciate it. Uh, best of uh, 
best of times for you during a, hopefully a, a somewhat quiet and calm spring? Chase, chasing grand, grandkids and golf balls. I'm going to say the grandkids are actually coming over from Madison. By the way, I hope everybody got through the, that line of tornadoes that went through Mississippi and Alabama and on mm -hmm. through your neck of the woods, I'm sure, uh, overnight. And uh, prayers for everybody in Baltimore involved with that yeah. uh, tragic uh, that awful, bridge yeah. going down. Uh, but, yeah, and um, you'll be seeing those dreaded videos of my golf swing really, really soon if you follow me on social media. The lefty. Media. I do. Phil, Phil I, I like every. I like every single one of them, Tim. Every because I'm like, there's there's a guy that's living the dream. So and, and he mentioned his grandkids. Sometimes have his grandkids on the golf course too. I'm yeah. like, there's oh, a yeah. guy living in paradise right now. Tee it off. Got the grandbabies there. Uh, you can't. Make. By the way, I love your old school pirates hat. I had one like that when I was a kid because I was on the pirates little league. Yeah. Grew up a Braves yeah. fan, but love that hat. Hey, signed, but, by, signed by old scrap iron Phil Garner. He actually gave me. Oh that. wow! But, That's but, awesome. But, but before he was a Brave, Raphael Belliard was a Pirate. So it all comes back to the light hitting, <laughs> slick fielding, <laughs> Tim Brando esque shortstop, defensive repla replacement himself, Timmy uh, B. So, so was Sid, Sid Bream, who I modeled my very short baseball career after, Mike. So great. Oh, yeah, very well, nice. I, I didn't have to have any knee surgeries, but I ran even worse than Sid Bream did. Sid Bream? Third. I can tell you that. That's fantastic. Well, my dad that. said he was slower than Al Poop. And then, and, and we were watching that game together, and he comes trucking, and oh my God, he, my dad jumped three feet. He couldn't believe it. When, when I was doing Braves games and, and Braves spring training games, they would give us former players in the booth. And one year, I had Sid Bream and Mark oh, Wollers, yeah. both outstanding guys. But remember, uh, Mark Wollers, who at one time was one of the best closers in Major League Baseball, also yeah. served up one of the most heartbreaking, painful home runs in Braves history to Jim yeah, Larry. In yep. Game Three, Yankees Braves. Yank the Braves were about to go up 3-0 and sweep the Yankees, and instead uh, he gives up. He throws a slider for some reason. I'd have he, more than one of these if he had not. Oh, that's that right, because you were part of that crew. So I got Sid Bream, and I'm at. I'm at Sid. How? Tell me about the slide. Tell me about this. Mark, um, let's talk about anything but <laughs> the slider you threw to Jim Lairis. <laughs> it was an awkward interview, but uh, oh, we, we got through it. As uh, I don't as, know. Did you guys see last year? It might have been um, – I don't know when it was, but the Bravos had um, – they had uh, uh, Chipper. They had um, – Oh, the all-players uh, broadcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Chipper, Robin, Frank Chipper. Yeah. It was awesome. It's awesome. It was, it was yeah. just awesome. And those guys were all great guys. They checked in their egos at the clubhouse door. Right. That was, those were the best of time. And by the way, what a great career hiccup period for me. Between, you know, my days at ESPN and CBS, I got to work with Ernie Sr. and call uh, the Braves in 94, 5, and 6. And one was a strike year, and two, not, the second one was a world championship. And the second one, they, Jim Leyritz, you know, home run ended a, what could have been a second straight title. But but it was a great time for me. You know, I, yeah. I when I got that uh, O'Connell Award, uh, Mike, you'll appreciate this. It was like, uh, it's more of a college basketball contributions award that they give through the name of Jim O'Connell, great mm -hmm. writer for the AP for years. And so, so much of my career passed through my head. I started remembering the people, whether it was uh, Steve Anderson and Steve Bornstein at ESPN or Jimmy Rayburn at Raycom, Terry Ewart, Sean McManus, and Tony Petiti at CBS and, now Eric Shanks and John Entz and, and now uh, Brad Zager at Fox. I've been so fortunate to have people th that crossed paths with me that were decision makers that for whatever reason, you know, subjectively thought my work was good, yeah. you know. And that's how you – next year when I start that season, uh, fellas, it'll be my 40th. That's right. On national TV. And, and you know, that's a milestone I really wanted to reach. And every stop – now, granted, I couldn't keep a job. Okay, I had to work a lot of places. <laughs> Who but you know what, Mike? It was, it was a godsend to work at all those places because I yeah. have more relationships as a result. Well, I've said this before, too, and I'm not just saying it because you're on here. Uh, I, I I think there are very few people. Uh, Musburger was the first in my generation. Growing up as a kid, I'm watching Musburger on NFL Today, and then I got to watch him, to, in my mind, do an outstanding job doing play-by-play yeah. -play for ESPN ABC. Nowadays, you and I both know, and we've talked about this off the air, Mm -hmm. uh, networks 
loved it to reward a studio host by saying because right. a studio host i could do play by play i could do play by play yeah. oh yeah they're dying, so they yeah. throw them out there and it's a, very often it's a substandard um yeah. product yeah. Not, without yeah. naming names you are one of the few guys that i thought excelled at both going back to college game day uh and and mm-hmm. and then of course you've now you've made your bones on on play by play but the cbs sports i know you know for for the south carolina fans listening they remember watching when you and Holtz are hosting the game day yeah. show and you're basically breaking the story that Holtz yeah. is about to leave for the South Carolina job. Yeah. And our, all of our crew had on the South Carolina jerseys. Yeah. Um, yeah. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. I and remember I you were the sideline reporter for the, I had for the first director, Mike McGee on speed dial for about a month during that time. That's right. That's right. That was a crazy, yeah. crazy. I remember the first South first year I followed college football was 86. This first year I knew, Sort of what it was. First game for the game guys that year was Miami. Vinny Testaverde coming to Williams Bryce. You're a sideline reporter. I remember that. And, uh, I think he did the Georgia game later that year too, if I'm not mistaken. Sure but then I remember you 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 got into game day and yeah, I remember setting up. Uh, we had the big screen fold out, you know, with the projector back in the day. <laughs> I remember watching you right there, Tim. So it's always yeah. awesome when you come on. Well, God. I appreciate it a lot. I've, I've just been blessed, you know, just blessed. And, and the calendar and the people, for whatever reason, um, that were in positions, because it is subjective. I mean, uh, we didn't we didn't have these deals back when I got started. If, if we had, I probably, you know, who knows? Uh, people would have been scared to hire me. Who knows? But, <laughs> We'd but, all be um, in trouble. Back then, back then, you only needed a few people to win over to get opportunities, and thankfully I did. But um, going down memory lane with you guys is something that's extra special. I'll be watching you, by the way. Uh, on your baseball travails, uh, Mike. So I'm I'm ready to hear the ping of the bat and watch yeah. that aluminum, you know, jettison the balls over the walls in the SEC. So I'll be watching. Absolutely, Timmy B. Always a pleasure, my friend. We'll do it again before too long. And uh, again, en- enjoy some some downtime and hit them straight. Okay, fellas. It you took us about it. seven minutes to say goodbye, but isn't that always the case? <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. We're, we, we're, <laughs> we we have in the show. We we don't have a boss yelling at us if we go yeah. over time. So that's a good Wouldn't thing. have it any other way, man. Yeah, so. That's right. Take care. Take, thank you, Tim. Take Tim care, Brando, Tim. one of our favorites here on JC and Morgan, joining us from the beautiful state of Louisiana. All right. So without Mad Dog Phil, JC, are we, we going just sign to, off? We're just signing off. Okay. I do want to mention yeah. again, one of our proud sponsors, Nest and Wild Mattress, the most comfortable mattress you can buy without some of the exorbitant prices that you'll find and you'll see advertised elsewhere. Based in Mississippi, locally owned and operated. Check them out. Nest and Wild Mattress. JC, uh, as always, a pleasure. We'll do it again next week. Uh, we got Andy Staples, I believe, coming on next week. We've been back and forth with Pete Thamel, just trying to work out a day and time. Uh, but more great guests coming up for you uh, throughout oh, yeah. this uh, "quote unquote" off season. Of course, spring football right around the corner, so we'll be talking some of the news and headlines about that as well. For JC Sherbert and Mad Dog Phil Molinax, our producer, thanks for tuning in. Another installment of JC and Morgan. We'll see you next.